and this is going to be um, relevant as I explain it afterward. Um, in 1978, half of white weekly churchgoers, <coughs> half of them were Democrats. By 1998, that number had dropped to 35% Democrats. Today, it's 25% in, in the white evangelical churches. Um, meanwhile, the Republican share has jumped 20 points in the last 40 years, going from 40% to 60% over that time frame. While um, devout white evangelicals um, kept drifting to the right, white young people actually changed course and moved back toward the Democrats and have kept moving that direction for the last 25 years. Saying Republican or Democrat, I think, all spikes a, a, a nerve, a, our adrenaline, even just hearing that. So if you can listen past that designation and hear what it is that these numbers are telling us. If young people are the future of the church, it's hard to see how both white and the, the uh, surveyed Catholics as well as uh, evangelicals can effectively reach out to the younger generation when their politics become further and further polarized. The close ties between white, white Christians and the Republic Par Republican Party may drive a wedge between them and the younger, unaffiliated young people they want to reach. And while mainland, mainline Protestants seem to the best situated to attract white young people, their share of the population has dropped by nearly, nearly two-thirds. Two-thirds of attendance in the mainline Protestant churches have left. And the average age of mainline Protestant church was 58 in 2018. Both facts make it difficult to appeal to the younger generation, if that's our goal. As the country becomes more diverse, Churches hope to become more diverse as well, but the political divide may keep people of color out of the white evangelical and Catholic spaces. This may seem great to some, but they need to understand that this distance between them and the people they are trying to reach grows larger every election cycle. We may say we shouldn't talk about politics in church, Except that we do when we say nothing about what the politics is saying about human beings and their worth based on trivial markers. So maybe we need to have a discussion in church because we are saying we're communicating things outside the church. I'm not taking a side or anything. I'm just saying we need to talk about it. Just to be clear. Love requires vulnerability. And I don't know if you can see, but Lysander is down um, feeding the horse. What was it, a peppermint thing? I don't, I don't even know what it was. Um, but the way um, to find favor with the horse is to be vulnerable. You have this huge animal and this mouth. I mean, you all have seen horses' mouths, right? They, they're like powerful, just the lips, you know, it, it's, it's kind of scary to put your palm out and leave it there for the horse to get it. It's vulnerable. That's like love, right? To create is to make something that has never existed before. There's nothing more vulnerable than that. Something new, something that's never existed. If we are so consumed by the all-consuming fire of the Spirit, if we believe that this account of what the Spirit of God did on the day of Pentecost over two millennia ago, our eyes, our hearts, our minds, all our strength would be so purified, so entirely infused by love, that love will be all that matters. Political affiliation, color of skin, the way you prepare your chicken, how you place your toilet paper roll, 
the top, right? Because that's the right way. <laughs> Which worship songs are more meaningful to you? If we are so consumed by the all-consuming fire of the Spirit, if we believe Luke's account is the way it happened at Pentecost, vulnerable love, vulnerable creative force would shoot out our cores like laser beams. That's how I imagine it. <laughs> Maybe not lasers, but an energy, a force, action. Jesus said, I will ask the Father to give you the advocate. She will be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth. That's where we find our truth, the spirit of God that is in us, the advocate or champion, defender, is given to us and she is truth in all of us, in each of us. Each of us who are created in the very image of God, right? And unique, all possess this truth, each only part of the truth. Still, tongues of fire, it was like tongues of fire that rested on each of them. And this is the same spirit that is given to us. Does it feel like tongues of fire? Are you on fire? The consuming, all consuming, an advocate, and friend, terrifying and safe. Now, isn't that exactly how love is? It seems to play out. It's vulnerable, it's scary, it's terrifying, and it is wonderful. Everything we ever wanted. This advocate will teach us everything. Each of us part of it, all of us, all of it. Together, we know the truth. It may seem that when we disagree, we are speaking different languages. Yet, these tongues of fire are unleashed at Pentecost. It is an ongoing project. Not just that one day, a couple thousand years ago. The tongues of fire are unleashed here and now. Do you believe it? Advocate, champion, friend, all-consuming while safe. Spirit. We took our eyes off of God and became content with our own plans. It happened in the first narrative at the, the Garden of Eden. It happened at the Tower of Babel. It continues to happen. I continue to take my eyes off of God and it is confusing. This threw us into chaos, it throws us into chaos, and when we could not understand each other, confused by the different languages because our eyes were on each other, not on the source of all power and wisdom and truth, the different ideas and ways of doing things, not on the work of justice and peace, so focused on the method that we lost sight of God's creative power. God's loving intent, but Jesus. Jesus was and is and is to come again, and because of Jesus' work, the Holy Spirit is released to empower, to consume us with God's love. Consume us, purify our hearts, incline toward God's, our ears attuned. Did you hear the Spirit of God? Have you heard the Spirit of God? Unifying us, empowering us. And love requires vulnerability. To create is to make something that has never existed before. What does that look like here? It's vulnerable. At annual conference this week, we prayed and praised and communed together. We listened and debated and voted on important Kingdom of God matters. We have a newly developed shepherding team 
and they shared their mission and their vision and strategic goals, and we will touch on this too, but I wanted to just go over um, three of their goals, and there are more to come. Mission. Their mission is to enable us, to empower us in the power of the Spirit, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. You may have heard that before. This is the kind of the mantra now. By equipping our local churches for ministry and by providing a connection for ministry beyond the local church, all for the glory of God. The vision is making and supporting vital Christians in vital congregations that engage with their communities in the world for peace, justice, and mercy. And their goals making disciples, congregations committed to growing and reaching new disciples of Jesus Christ, they will be actively engaged in disciple-making activities. We need to make something new, create something that has not existed before in this time. What does that look like for us? And two, there's three goals for here for right now. They're, they have more, but the second one is working against racism. All of the ways, of all the ways to love our neighbors working actively against racism has the greatest potential to transform the world. Congregations will strive to identify, challenge, and change values and attitudes, organizational structures, policies, and practices that perpetuate systemic racism. What does that look like for Duran? I don't know. We need to, we need to think. Pray, be empowered, create. And then three, creating vital congregations. Currently, there are 360 freestanding UMCs in North, uh, Northern Illinois. 360. Four, right? Four of them were closed. Five were officially closed. Um, smaller churches, but not thriving. So that we could put, so that they could put um, people at, at better effort um, to continue in these in this mission. They're looking for long-term sustainability, mature spiritual vitality, and the exercise of stewardship over all our ministry resources. One thing that was said and witnessed to, observed and prophesied through the whole time over and over again, God is doing a new thing here, and I believe God is doing a new thing in Durand. Will you believe that with me? Create something that has never existed before and be vulnerable, be okay with that. Dee, I've asked Dee to just give a short, um, oh, summary of it. And I spoke too long, come, come. Thank you. No, keep me, keep me moving. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Okay. All right. Um, although much love and goodwill was expressed on all sides, this year's annual conference was a rather sobering event. We had many serious issues to discuss and legislation on which to vote. This was due to the vote taken at special, at special conference in February, which did not find a con um, compromise on a controversial issue. That final vote was not only punitive to all who disagreed with the decision, but it was also taken under questionable circumstances that need to be fully investigated and addressed. Also, it should be noted that many foreign countries do not have our book of discipline or any book of discipline, so those at the general conference were not all operating under the same rules and number of delegates per district. Since these irregularities have happened in general conference votes of previous years too, we felt we needed to take action. Legislation was passed stating that we will not send funds that support the General Conference Administration until such time as these irregularities can be investigated and corrected. 
since this legislation was coming up, these particular funds were not placed on our apportionment bill, no, nor will they be collected. <coughs> when the issues are fixed, we will then be billed this part of apportionment. As you know, the vote in February turned down the one church plan, the compromise that would have allowed individual churches to decide to either marry or not to marry LGBT people as their congregation wish. Instead, the traditional plan was passed with severe penalties for disregarding the marrying or ordaining of LGBT people. During the conference this week, our Northern Illinois Conference reaffirmed its reconciling nature with the LGBT community in a variety of different leg legislation passed, and our motto will remain, do no harm. In her address, Bishop Dyke highlighted all the following. We need more points of entry to God, not fewer. We do not know what these paths will look like, but we are committed to getting to the future intact and to do no harm along the way. We are committed to justice and inclusion. We want to provoke one another only to love and good deeds. And along the way, we should not take our eyes off of what we should be doing, our goal of caring for our neighbor. In light of that, strategic goals were passed with suggestions on how to accomplish them. Very briefly, they are again, one, to grow and reach new disciples, two, to live out the conviction that racism is incompatible with Christian teaching, three, to increase the number of highly vital <coughs> congregations. Finally, we took a non-binding straw poll of the direction for the future we thought our conference should take if given the opportunity. The choices were, one, a conference that allows clergy to officiate at same gender weddings and to ordain um, ministers of people with varying sexual identities, or two, the traditional plan as enacted in February this year. The vote was 441 for option number one and 79 for option number two. In the community room, I have put on the table the press release by the Northern Illinois Conference, several pieces of actual legislation passed, and various brochures from the annual conference. Please feel free to ask me any questions and take a look at those. Thanks.